The next item of business is a debate on motion number 1828 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the draft BBC Charter. And I would ask members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Fiona Hislop to speak to and to move the motion. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name and welcome this opportunity to open this debate on the renewal of the BBC Charter. The draft charter was published on the September 15th and sets out the UK government's expectations of the corporation for the next 11 years. For the first time, the Scottish government has had a consultative role in the charter's development and I ensured that this would be throughout the process. The Scottish Government's approach has been to seek consensus and agree a vision that would bring the BBC up to date, making it more relevant to a devolved nation and bring its governance and delivery much closer to Scotland's audiences. And the process has seen a genuinely constructive dialogue between the many people who believe in public service broadcasting and believe it can be better. This includes independent producers, other broadcasters, equality and diversity bodies, broadcast experts, and indeed this parliament in the motion passed on the 23rd of February. During this time, I have met the former and current Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport to reiterate our proposals and suggest how they might be incorporated in the Charter. I contributed to David Clementi's review of the BBC's governance and regulation. I have met Ofcom's chief executive. I have engaged with the BBC Trust, the relevant parliamentary committees, and a number of stakeholders whose expert views I have been keen to factor into our thinking. And I've had meetings with the BBC Director General and with BBC Scotland. I will now update the Chamber on what we have achieved and where we think the Charter could be improved. The draft charter is an improvement, but doesn't fully deliver the BBC we believe needs to be in place to properly serve the people of Scotland. Our vision for the BBC's future is rooted in three overarching objectives, which are predicated on our commitment to the corporation's ongoing uh, editorial independence. Firstly, to empower BBC Scotland to address the concerns of audiences and deliver better outcomes, including more representative content across all outputs. Secondly, to ensure that the governance and structure of the BBC is more responsive, reflecting the devolved nature of the UK, being able to deliver similarly decentralised decision making. And thirdly, we expect that through these structures, the BBC can deliver better outcomes for audiences and implement commissioning and editorial practices which will support the growth and sustainability of Scotland's creative industries. Now, we achieved the following, which are welcome improvements. An enforceable service licence for Scotland. The Secretary of State has confirmed that this will ensure the commitments made by Lord Hall will flow through to Ofcom's new licensing regime. And more importantly, the BBC will have to deliver for Scotland against tangible targets. A dedicated board member for Scotland, a commitment to continued support for Gaelic Broadcasting and MG Alba, and proposals for the BBC to report on its contribution to Scotland's creative economy for the very first time removing the charter from the election cycle and a new public purpose to reflect, represent and serve the nations and regions. I think we have moved into a new era of accountability and scrutiny. This parliament will have powers to scrutinise the BBC, to call it to appear before the relevant committee and to hold it to account. Indeed, this parliament has already begun to scrutinise the charter through the work of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. The new BBC board will have a non-executive member for Scotland and it will be their job to ensure that Scotland's interests are understood and taken seriously. The unitary board structure set out in the Charter is consistent with part of our proposals. However, we believe that in order to deliver better outcomes and greater transparency, that Scotland, along with Wales and Northern Ireland, should also have their own national boards. Yes, indeed. Tavis to uh, Fiona Hislop for giving me that point. I noticed in the letter she's received from the UK uh, Culture Minister, or Sec uh, Secretary of State, I should say, um, it says that um, in the, in, with regard to appointments to the Unitary Board, your involvement in the appointments process over the coming weeks, but this will include asking you for your agreement to the final appointment. Is that indeed the case? Will the Scottish Government in that sense have what I might describe as a veto over the appointment itself? Well, similar to the fact that we currently have uh, input to the BBC Trust appointment, we would expect to uh, have input constructively in what should be an open, fair and transparent public appointment uh, to, 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 to this position. So we would have involvement, but as we have in many actually areas in culture and heritage, we can do and will do that on a constructive basis. And I would actually hope that the appointment would not only be able to serve Scotland, but would be able to have a very active input into a whole range of issues on a UK-wide basis 
basis. And that person could be a link with, between the unitary board uh, for the BBC and also with the Scottish board that we think should still uh, happen. We believe that if the BBC is to remain relevant, it needs to keep pace with the realities of devolution uh, and that it should decentralise its, uh, its funds should be redistributed and editorial and commissioning decisions be devolved. Gallic Broadcasting, uh, President Officer, is a good example of where a clear step change on one relatively small area of broadcasting would deliver improved outcomes across a number of areas such as audience satisfaction and investment in our creative industries. The agreement sets out a commitment for the BBC to continue its partnership with MG Alba for the next 11 years and we welcome this but it does not go far enough and we must continue to press home that nothing short of a credible move towards parity with the funding model in place for S4C is acceptable. And the ask is modest, 10 hours of original programming a week. This constitutes a relatively small investment from the BBC but would be a just and positive outcome which would have an enormously positive impact for audiences and for the creative sector. Presiding officer, we have emphatically championed the BBC's editorial independence throughout. The BBC plays a crucial role in supporting the social, cultural and democratic life of our nation. Our policy position is to decouple the charter from the Westminster election cycle has been achieved and the 11 year cycle enshrined in the charter. The BBC must be empowered to ensure it plays the best role it can in terms of social, cultural and democratic experiences for audiences in Scotland. And I'm sure we all look forward to a Daily Mail front page claiming the charter blocks the creation of a Scottish Six winning its author a particularly uncoveted prize from the Scottish Parliament's Journalists Association later this year. The fact that STV may steal, steal a march on the BBC with an ST, STV7 shows what can be done. Now the draft charter sets a, a stronger public purpose to reflect, represent and serve the diverse communities of Scotland and the other nations and regions of the UK. And I have continuously pressed for this and we have achieved this. What is more, in delivering this, the BBC must also invest in the creative economies of the nations and, for the first time, be accountable for that. For me, this means that we should, and indeed we expect, increased and improved content and programming, which is made in Scotland, for the people of Scotland and for the wider network, which draws upon the technical and creative talent that we have in Scotland across all BBC's services. So this shouldn't just deliver greater investment in our creative sector, it should also see strides being made in the representation and engagement of Scotland's diverse peoples, with richer and more complex narratives emerging in the wake of greater visibility for stories from Scotland and participation for women, for minority ethnic people, for disabled people and for LGBT people across Scotland and across the UK. The BBC as an institution needs to have more, more diversity in its decision making arrangements and it needs to draw on the diversity of talent and experience across the country. This public purpose, uh, coupled with the promises made by the BBC's Director General in May 2016, including additional funding for improving services for more dedicated content, marks a significant commitment to Scotland's people and a commitment that we must hold the BBC to. The Charter directs the BBC in its annual plan to set out how it will deliver upon its duties, including improving services for Scotland, and we welcome the moves to strengthen the BBC's requirement to report against its creative remit nation by nation. I would expect uh, that this requirement would encourage the BBC to look at the big picture across Scotland and make a more strategic approach with an eye to the future structured by ambition, vision and energy uh, instead of the current situation where retrospectively they assess investment simply to deliver for the quota and qu relying on snooker coverage, for example, to make up the quota numbers. And snooker from Sheffield presiding officer is hardly Scottish. In doing so, I would also urge the BBC to consider how it will take audience views into account. Now, the BBC is now required to report in detail on how well it is delivering against its plans and Ofcom will act as regulator. A strong and well-resourced Ofcom is key in holding the BBC to account and I met Ofcom's chief executive on the 23rd of August and gained her commitment to work with us in order to ensure that the needs of Scotland's people are properly served, specifically through a service licence which makes clear the expectations placed upon the corporation. 
However, as we've recently made clear, the regulator can only regulate effectively if properly resourced to do so, and this should not be through top slicing the BBC licence fee. So I've committed to working with Ofcom to help understand the shape and the scope of the service licence, and I look forward to further discussions on this matter. Turning to, to radio, BBC Radio remains part of the fabric of life in Scotland, and I think it is worth once again raising the question of just how the BBC really views BBC Radio Scotland. Do they see it as truly a national station, such as Radio 4, or do they view it uh, as another regional station? And throughout this process, I've been clear that the BBC needs to invest more in radio in Scotland, both in commissioning for the wider BBC radio network and in the funding of Radio Scotland and BBC Radio, radio Nangeo. It must also acknowledge the appetite for the expansion of national radio provision. Presiding officer, I welcome the Secretary of State's response to our requests and her cooperation and uh, the meeting that I've had with her. Uh, but I, I would urge that she might go further. Scotland's ask has been simple, credible, and supported by a wide range of organisations and individuals who agree that business as usual is not acceptable. It is unjust, unfair, and plain wrong that Scotland raises over £320 million in licence fee revenue to see only 55% of that return on spend by the BBC to Scotland. Without full commissioning and editorial control of the licence fee raised here, the BBC in Scotland will not be all it can and should be. A simple analysis of the BBC's accounts lays bare the misrepresentation that Scotland gets what it deserves and, and the remaining monies are invested in wider services which, make, which, which uh, uh, Scotland's audiences enjoy. The investment the BBC makes uh, in the other nations uh, is greater. Scotland has been losing out for years and this must be put right. We continue to press for change. The UK government has at times taken a seemingly arbitrary view on what matters are policy decisions for the BBC and which are legitimate items for a charter. And we continue to assert that it is not appropriate to leave such crucial matters to the commitment of individuals who come and go. And although the commitments outlined in Lord Hall's letter of the 12th of May, such as setting portrayal objectives for commissioners and strengthening Scotland as a centre for excellence for factual production are welcome, these decisions of decentralisation need to be properly secured. And it's only through anchoring decentralisation in the Charter itself that the BBC can be held to account. So why is it that the views from Scotland are somehow seen as partial and self-interested compared to the views from the offices of BBC executives and London and Salford? A readjustment in that relationship, I think, will be good for all, will enhance decision-making and accountability and indeed provide a better offer for audiences. So, presiding officer, in closing my remarks, I, I want to say this. Now is the time for the BBC to be truly bold and ambitious for itself, and in so doing, be ambitious for Scotland. And I urge the corporation to seize this opportunity to deliver a step change in what it does and how it does it, to provide substantive, quality public service broadcasting now and in the future. Thank you. I call on Jackson Carlo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My goodness, the Cabinet Secretary finished off just as another speech did yesterday. Time for change seized the moment. Well, there we go. Uh, this, unlike uh, my favourite children's television programme, uh, isn't a speech I made earlier. I was very keen to hear what the Cabinet Secretary had to say in introduction. And actually, I agree with a great deal of it. And I think there is a considerable amount of consensus. There are a number of highlighted points that she made um, which I think are challenges to the BBC, the analysis underpinning them I might not entirely share, and I'll touch on that uh, in my speech. Um, the Prime Minister yesterday actually put the BBC and the NHS together in the same bundle, and I suppose in a sense they are both cradle-to-grave services that uh, we expect and enjoy. Um, for myself, it began with Andy Pandy and the Wooden Tops, through Blue Peter and uh, Animal Magic to Doctor Who, from Nationwide through Reporting Scotland, then with the formidable Mary Marquis, now with the equally formidable Sally Magnuson, Colditz and Secret Army, I, Claudius to Night Manager and War and Peace, Dad's Army, and then on the radio, Junior Choice with Ed Stewart to Radio 1 to Radio 2. I sometimes feel a Radio 2 and a half would probably suit me now. Drama, comedy, The Archers, The Today programme are all part of my daily life on Radio 4. Um, and I'm told if I keep this analogy up long enough, I will eventually revert back to Andy Pandy and the wooden tops when I get to a <laughs> later stage in life. Uh, 
No, because I, I know you probably were on all of these programmes at a, an earlier stage in your career, Mr Stevenson, and I'm not going to put myself through that. Um, I was also somebody who benefited from the World Service personally. My family were in Cyprus during the Turkish invasion in 1974, and it was to the World Service that we turned for all the information upon which we relied. Perhaps that's why Kofi Annan said that Britain's greatest gift to the world in the 20th century has been the BBC World Service. And throughout my life, the Radio Times itself has been a feature in terms of looking and cherishing all the different quality programmes that are produced. Of course, I'm, not a, I'm a friend of the BBC, I'm a fan of the BBC, I'm not a, uncritical of it. Nor, of course, was the former First Minister who uh, referred to their coverage of the referendum as being nothing short of Pravda, uh, which of course came as a great surprise to Comrade Bird and Comrade Taylor. Uh, now, what we have here is a charter for the next 11 years, which, as the uh, Cabinet Secretary has alluded to, takes it out with the electoral cycle. Um, in fact, the participation of the Scottish Government, of the Scottish Parliament, was one of the commitments that was made in the Smith Commission, and which I hope all parties feel has been uh, fully vindicated and, uh, and fully honoured. Uh, not only has the Scottish Government been actively participating in this process, the other devolved nations have been too. Uh, the BBC will now present themselves to committees of this Parliament, having laid their annual accounts open to us. Uh, and there is an opportunity, uh, halfway through this Charter review, for an interim review, which I think is an especially important, because much of what potentially is available to us as a result of this Charter will depend upon the spirit with which the BBC now seek to deliver it. And the fact that there is an interim review at the midway point will allow us to test whether or not uh, that has actually taken place. Yes, of course. Cabinet Secretary. I appreciate the arguments he's making about interim review, but he should be aware that there are also concerns that should there be a pol political wind change about the BBC, that an interim review could, might be seen as a threat rather than an opportunity. No, I, I understand the point that the Cabinet Secretary makes. I think, however, the Charter ought to give it the political guarantee it needs, but I do think there is a need, because the Cabinet Secretary herself has identified areas in which she wishes to see the BBC respond to the new Charter, that there has to be an opportunity for this Parliament, as much as any other, to interrogate to ensure are taking place. And those do come down, I think, to the whole question of uh, editorial independence and commissioning here in Scotland. Now, I'm going to try and stay free of the jargon that many of us have picked up, so I won't, other than saying I'm not referring to lift and shift, refer to it again. But clearly, in the last charter, where a percentage of programming was meant to be established here in Scotland, uh, producers and others found that the convenient way to bypass that was simply to have uh, established programmes relocate to Scotland uh, to fulfill the exercise of ticking a box, but without actually there being any sustained or permanent uh, outcome for the creative industries here in Scotland. Uh, and that's, that policy actually underpins the 55% figure that the Cabinet Secretary referred to, because the amount of spend actually is a function of the genuine commissioning that takes place in Scotland. And because Waterloo Road was cancelled, suddenly the share of that kind of expenditure led to a drop in what was being allocated to Scotland. Now, that is not good enough. And that's why I welcome the appointment of Ken Macquarie to a post that was abolished in 2009, and the appointment of drama and comedy commissioners here in Scotland. But the key thing will not just be their existing in a desk at Pacific Key, but their being able to genuinely influence the budget decisions that are made about the spend on programming here in Scotland. Now, I do think there's a challenge for the government in this. When the BBC launched the Charter, they also announced that a key number of programmes would now be available for tendering around the UK and from the independent sector. Programmes such as Holby City and Songs of Praise, for example. The very same afternoon, the very same afternoon, Invest Northern Ireland were in touch with Northern Ireland Screen and all the independent sectors in Northern Ireland to see how they could work with them to secure those programmes in Northern Ireland. Now, it's quite clear from talking to the independent sector here in Scotland 
that the Scottish enterprise does not have anything like the same enthusiasm for becoming involved in investing in the creative industries in Scotland. It's not just Creative Scotland with its small budget that we need to see. We need to see Scottish enterprise, the equivalent of Invest Northern Ireland, work with Creative Scotland and the government to make sure that the independent producers here in Scotland are able to take advantage of the new commissioning opportunities that now exist. Secondly, I think although programming isn't just drama, although drama is hugely important, it can be documentary, which doesn't require studio facility. And although we don't just want programming that is all about Scotland, but Scotland making programming about the world, it's important if we talk in, in drama capacity terms that we have the studio capacity here in Scotland to deliver that. And we don't. I know the government have made investment in supporting the uh, Cumbernauld facility, which is underwriting, which is the home of the digital drama production Outlander. But there is a huge potential beyond that, and that is why I hope that the, uh, the proposal for a Pentland Studios, which I know is one which is under active consideration, perhaps active consideration for a little longer than many would like, but I hope it can succeed. Because if we are going to really take advantage, not just of the commissioning opportunities of the BBC to produce long-term series, pro series production here in Scotland, but also to take advantage of the new international digital high-quality drama network production, both of which, long-term drama series, stimulate the tourist industry here in Scotland, as Visit Scotland has already found with Outlander, now producing an Outlander tourist map for the many people coming here. We've got to have the studio capacity for the independents who want to take advantage of the BBC commissioning budget that could come to Scotland to actually produce the programmes here and create the infrastructure and nurture the talent that we want to see developed in Scotland. So I think that there does have to be a degree of leadership from the BBC, but also from the government to, uh, to ensure that we are able to capitalise on that. Uh, presiding officer, um, can I say that I think there are huge challenges for the BBC. I think that the government are, I agree with much of what they've said. I think the editorial independence of the BBC is fundamental. I think the charter gives us huge opportunities. And we certainly, through the Culture Committee and with the government, will work to ensure that we maximise the potential for Scotland in this new environment. Thank you, Colin. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, President Officer. Scottish Labour welcomes this debate and progress uh, we believe has been made in recent months. We believe the draft charter and framework agreement now offer a more certain future for the BBC in general and public service broadcasting in Scotland in particular. A few months ago, there was real cause for concern. Changes proposed by Conservative ministers to the governance of the BBC uh, appeared to call into question the editorial integrity and independence of the corporation. At the same time, the process of charter renewal in Scotland was in danger of getting drawn into the constitutional debate, which would have threatened the independence of the BBC from a different direction. Today, we appear to have moved on, at least in some very important respects. The UK government has accepted that it should be the BBC and not ministers who appoint a majority of board members, and that there should be a senior independent director, as well as a chair appointed by government. The Cabinet Secretary's approach to today's debate confirms that SNP ministers also recognise the draft chapter and framework agreement as a basis for further progress, though she clearly has some continuing reservations, and not all of those uh, may be addressed uh, in the weeks ahead. We shall see. But our focus now should not be on issues of constitution or governance. It should be on investment in creativity and adding economic value. We debated an eco certain Mr. McMillan. I thank Lewis MacDonald for taking the, the intervention. Uh, he mentioned there regarding governance, but surely governance is absolutely crucial in any organisation going forward. Mr. McMillan will agree with me that the changes to governance contained in the Charter have indeed moved things forward and moved things in the right direction. I think there is sufficient uh, in that to uh, now allow us uh, to focus on the issues uh, of creativity and of economic benefit that lie ahead. And we debated a year ago an economic committee report on the economic impact of television and other creative industries, in which I highlighted the importance of quotas under the BBC's existing charter for production out with London and the stimulus they already offered to Scottish production companies. That sector was well represented in giving evidence to last week's meeting of the Culture Committee, and their views of the draft charter are worth noting. David Smith of Matchlight said, this charter is a welcome step forward 
but it is not the end of the journey by any stretch. David Strachan of Turn Television said the Charter offers a number of checks and balances that did not exist before that allow for scrutiny by this place and by other organisations. And Rosina Robson of PAC, the Producers Alliance for Cinema and Television said, we are pleased with the overall shape of the Charter and the agreement. There will be more opportunities for production companies in Scotland and around the UK to pitch for because the BBC will be that much more open. Those witnesses set the tone for the committee's evidence session last week, and I hope that it is that approach which sets the tone for our debate today. As well as improving the governance proposals for the BBC as a whole, the draft charter does build on the existing charter in strengthening the BBC's focus on the nations and regions of the UK, and also its ability to further strengthen the independent production sector in Scotland. There are now very specific requirements placed on the BBC, as has been mentioned and as have already been welcomed. The accountability of the BBC to this parliament and to the devolved administrations here and elsewhere is central. We can look forward to many more opportunities to scrutinise the senior management of the BBC, as committee members did last week, and to hold them to account for delivery of their strategy and plans. The amended public purpose is very significant. The BBC must reflect, represent and serve the diverse communities of all of the United Kingdom's nations and region. That, of course, does not just require representation of Scotland, as seen from Holyrood or from Pacific Quay. Scotland's regions must be fully represented too. Not only that, but in meeting that duty, the BBC must also support the creative economy across the United Kingdom. That, again, is good news for all of our creative hubs, Aberdeen as well as Glasgow, the Hebrides as well as the Central Belt. The Framework Agreement commits the BBC to continued support for Gaelic Broadcasting in partnership with MG Alipa. That partnership is responsible for around half the total number of Irish commissioned from production companies in Scotland. So that commitment really matters. But as Fiona Hislop said, it is not enough on its own. BBC Alipa currently makes 4.2 hours of new Gaelic language programmes each week, compared with the BBC's equivalent Welsh language commitment of 10 hours a week. And we too want to see a commitment to 10 hours weekly to really secure the future of that service. And we believe also that that should be funded centrally by the BBC across the UK and not simply uh, diverted from the spend already undertaken by BBC Scotland. That would surely meet the spirit of the BBC's new purpose to represent the diversity of communities across the United Kingdom. Television is hugely important, but as I think Jackson Carlos said, it is not the whole story. If real progress has been made through quotas for TV production out with Greater London since 2006, we need to see real progress in radio and online content over the term of the next charter. The BBC itself if, can, if it so chooses, set targets for the share of network radio programming and online content made in the nations and regions. And if it does so, Scotland stands to benefit accordingly. The new board of the BBC, uh, we believe, should make that an early priority. The draft charter and agreement provide a framework for the work of the BBC over the next 11 years. By definition, a framework is not prescriptive. It doesn't tell the BBC what to do day by day or issue by issue, but it does clearly indicate the direction of travel. And it is for the BBC now to make its own decisions as a public service broadcaster, independent of government control. But I think the appointment of Ken Macquarie as BBC Director for Nations and Regions uh, is to be welcomed as an indication of intent and the, the intention also to uh, uh, appoint commissioners here in Scotland. For this parliament, it is for us to use our new responsibilities to encourage those kind of decisions by the BBC that will move us further, for, further forward over the next 11 years. One of the things the Economy Committee found last year was that Scotland had lost ground on film and TV relative to other nations and regions in the UK. Jackson Carlo mentioned Northern Ireland, which has forged ahead with top-class studio facilities and a government agency dedicated to the film and TV sector. And I know the Cabinet Secretary is aware of, of, of the positive uh, lessons to be drawn from that and seeking to address those. But Northern Ireland's success is also down to a culture of partnership working. Politicians there do not seem to see the BBC as a problem. They see it as a partner bringing in business and adding value. It is that culture we should aim for over the next 11 years to work together to achieve sustained growth in programme production in Scotland and to realise the full potential which the draft charter now offers. Thank you. Thank you. We now enter the open part of the debate. I call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by Rachel Hamilton.
Carpenter. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I welcome the consensual nature of the debate? In fact, it's so consensual that I find that many of the points I was going to make have already been made by Jackson Carlow and Lewis MacDonald, as well as the Cabinet Secretary, so that's a bit of a surprise. Uh, last week, this Parliament's uh, Culture Committee, as Lewis MacDonald, as Jackson Carlow has mentioned, took evidence on, on the Charter, and we had witnesses from independent production sector and MG Alba and the BBC. And uh, as, as Lewis MacDonald has um, already mentioned, independent producers in Scotland uh, have welcomed the Charter as a step uh, in the right direction. And I congratulate the Cabinet Secretary and indeed the committees of this Parliament uh, in the past, such as the Education and Cultural Committee, for the input that they have had uh, towards um, uh, the charter and the shape that it, the, the draft is in. Um, the independent production companies in particular welcomed Article 6 of the charter, uh, which states in commissioning and delivering output, the BBC should invest in the creative economies of each of the nations and contribute to their development. The BBC also must now report its creative remits, remits on a nation by nation basis, and this is good. I'd also like to draw attention to Article 5 of the Charter, which outlines five public purposes, one of which is to, quote, reflect, represent and serve the diverse communities of all of the United Kingdom's nations and regions. So Articles 5 and 6 between them say that strengthening television production in Scotland has both a cultural and an economic um, uh, purpose. Now, Director General Tony Hall, as the Cabinet Secretary has, has already alluded to, admitted in May that the Corporation has not done enough to reflect Scotland itself and the rest of the UK uh, so far, and obviously there's a hope that the draft charter uh, will, ad will address that. However, I have a concern that Lord Hall's deputy, Anne Bulford, in her oral evidence to the committee last week did not appear to show the same understanding as her boss, and that's worrying because Mrs Bulford is in charge of the BBC's finances. Uh, the committee heard, as others have said, that only 5% of the licence fee raised in Scotland is spent in Scotland, and that compares to 74% in Northern Ireland and 95% in Wales. And other people have quoted David Strachan uh, of um, uh, the independent production company Tern, who explains lift and shift this way. There are companies that move to Scotland temporarily, rent a desk or two, put up a brass nameplate, consume quota and then disappear again as soon as the commission is finished. Uh, an early example of that of the weakest, uh, of the weakest link and uh, the, the Sheffield snooker, which is under review by Ofcom at the moment. And this has a real impact on employment. The committee heard that from 2012 to 2015, employment has fallen by 27% in Scottish TV production despite Ofcom's target for network production actually being met and that's because of lift and shift and this isn't a new thing it's been criticized for years it was previously criticized by the inquiry into the creative industries conducted by the economy committee in the last session of this parliament when industry witnesses told us they had experience in gain they had very poor experience in gaining access to London based commissioners to pitch their ideas they, they spoke of phone calls not being returned emails requesting meetings which were ignored and that inquiry report published in March last year recommended that commissioners ab abandon their reliance on lift and shift and invest in independent TV companies with a permanent uh, base in Scotland and set a deadline uh, for late 2016 and in fairness that was addressed to Channel 4 uh, as well as the BBC. However, Ms Bulford uh, at the committee session last week point blank denied that there was any evidence of a prejudice by commissioners against companies outside London. Uh, MSPs repeatedly asked Ms Bulford for assurances that the 55% would not happen again uh, and they requested that she name a more ambitious target but she failed to do that as well. Uh, Ms Bulford and other BBC witnesses fell back on the discredited excuses such as asserting that Scotland gets access to prestigious network services in return for its licence fee. But as David Smith from Matchlight said, Wales and Northern Ireland also benefit from these um, network productions and big sporting events like the Olympic Games and Radio 4, but they still keep more of their licence fee. The committee also took evidence from Donald Campbell of MG Alba, uh, who was pleased that the draft agreement stated that, that the BBC must support the provision of output in Gaelic language in Scotland and provide a television service through partnership with MG Alba. Uh, but Mr Campbell was concerned 
that there was no coherent policy uh, towards minority languages. Um, I think we're all agreed that BBC Alba is extremely high quality and reaches 15% of the national audience. And I think it's important to make the point that there's no lift and shift in Gaelic TV. Every penny allocated to Scotland is spent here. And I know that Bannon, the MG Alba drama, is already being sold internationally, which puts them ahead of uh, language, English language drama from Scotland. And the Economy Committee, the witnesses that we spoke to from the industry, identified a lack of high-end drama from Scotland as a major failing uh, uh, here in, in, uh, in terms of our culture as well as the, the economy. The, B, the BBC made great play last week of a new drama commissioner in Scotland, but as the committee discovered, the commissioner will still have to defer to decision makers in London and will have no realistic budget. Um, I'd also like to draw attention to the fact that much of the drama made in Scotland till now, even when it makes a major economic contribution, has not necessarily reflected authentic Scottish experience. Uh, Waterloo Road is a very good example of that. It was a good idea if it had actually built up the infrastructure here that allowed us to do other things, but it's gone and it doesn't seem to have built up the infrastructure here. So that's a, that's a, a, a really um, significant problem. I felt that Ms Bulford didn't recognise the point that, um, that there could be stuff made in Scotland, auth very authentic stuff emanating from Scotland that was drama that would appeal across the UK. And I think this ignores the fact that things like in the past, it's gone back quite a, a way, but train spotting is something that's very vernacular, but it's one of our biggest cinematic successes. And if you look at American dramas such as The Wire that in the past have been very uh, very uh, successful on television. They too are in the vernacular and they're very specific to the place that they come from, but they're still very popular. Can so, Mr McCarthy move to a conclusion, please? Thank, thank you. you very much. So I think while I, I certainly um, believe that the Charter goes, uh, goes far in addressing some of the problems that have identified here in Scotland in the past, I would like to see it, tough, it toughened up and I would like to make sure that this Parliament, if the Charter stays as it is at the moment, gets the opportunity to scrutinise uh, what the BBC is doing and make sure that it is decentralised and delivers what I think everybody in this Parliament wants to see for both the economy uh, and the culture of Scotland. Thank you very much. Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Presiding officer, as a child, I was never allowed to watch Tis Was for fear I would get out of hand. My parents banned ITV, believing that watching Chris Tarrant and Sally Harris, Harris get pied and drenched in semolina, baked beans and custard was not a good example to set. Instead, when the door was open, I obediently set the big old TV to channel one, the good old Beeb, swap shop with Noel Edmonds, suitably inoffensive and educational entertainment. <laughs> Even if in recent times you have veered away to online streaming platforms, the BBC has always been reliable. That's why many of us, particularly Ruth Davison, still sneaks a fix of Strictly or The Andrew Marr Show. To give it its due, the BBC is central to the lives of so many people here and overseas and has a global audience of 348 million reaching across radio, BBC, world service, BBC Global News, TV and online. However, to progress, reform is essential, essential and today we debate the BBC's renewal, ch renewal charter because the current BBC charter expires, as everyone said, at the end of this year. We welcome the new draft charter and in particular the enhanced emphasis on the nations through the charter and the increased input from the devolved legislators, including this parliament and the commitment from the UK government to listen carefully to the issues raised in our debates before submitting the final documents. Over 300 organisations and experts have engaged in the charter review process and over 190,000 responses to the public consultation were received. 80,000 of consultation responses said the BBC serves its audience well or very well. However, for its notable successes, the BBC faced questions about its governance, its distinctiveness, market impact, how it serves society, efficiency and value for money, and technology was also a key area of discussion. Further, the 2006 Charter looked at digital switchover, but said nothing about BBC iPlayer, nor did it say anything about BBC Alba, two of the most successful TV content initiatives of the last decade. Throughout the Charter review process, the, the UK government consulted with the Scottish government on the contents of the draft BBC Charter and Framework Agreement, in particular on the areas which affect Scotland. Indeed, decisions on the forthcoming investment and commissioning decisions will de further develop the BBC's offering in Scotland, and the BBC have affirmed their commitment to continue working with BBC Scotland to build Scotland's share of the network commissioning. 
Delivering evidence at the European and External Affairs Committee last week, the Deputy Director General of the BBC, Anne Bulford, announced the appointments of a new drama commissioner and a new comedy com commissioner for Scotland. The new commissioners will set portrayal objectives so that all areas of network content will accurately and authentically reflect the lives of audiences across the whole of the UK. Also, a drama development fund will be set up and Scotland will be identified as a centre for excellence for the BBC in factual production. These promises are meaningful and here in Scotland we hope to see the intention that different cultures and alternative viewpoints will be represented. Additionally, the new draft charter ensures that a non-executive director for Scotland will sit on the BBC's new unitary board and become a link, as Fiona Hislop said earlier. Across this chamber, we put our trust in the BBC to meet their commitment to reflect the diversity of the United Kingdom, both in its output and services. Revisions have been made to reflect devolution and changes in our democracy in news and sports coverage by announcing a nation's edition of home pages for the BBC news sites and to follow uh, a, news, a nation's edition for BBC iPlayer and a BBC sports website. Delivering accountability to the devolved nations, as stated in point five of Article 6, is integral. And as Joan McAlpine quoted, I quote too, to reflect, represent, and serve the diverse communities of all the United Kingdom's nations and regions, and in doing so, support the creative economy across the United Kingdom. These words, we hope, will be put into action by Ken Macquarie, the new Director of Nations and Regions. Mr Macquarie has been appointed as a voice for Scotland. He said at the committee last week, how we invest in the nations and regions and the creative economy of the nations is absolutely at the top of the Director General's priorities. The BBC Charter will agree a new partnership with Creative Scotland, which will aim to match the partnership we have with Northern Ireland Screen, as Jackson alluded to. His comments about commitment to Scottish production were underpinned by evidence taken at last week's committee from stakeholders, including Creative Scotland. The stakeholders want to see high quality production staged and managed in Scotland, ultimately contributing to Scotland's economy and avoiding the lift and shift, shift concept, which has already been mentioned today. The new director of nations and regions also talked about encouraging new talent through Skills Development Scotland and setting up apprenticeships by further contributing to growing Scotland's creative economy. So I leave it with you, dear Beeb. We are willing you all the way to represent Scotland's stories of our hills, our lochs and our people. You have listened and now it's time for action. One final parting observation. Will the spirit of the new BBC Charter entice the granny that everybody wants? Scots loving iconic baker Mary Berry and the quick-witted and satirical beloved Bake Off duo Mel and Sue. Perhaps they could produce a new series set on Carberry Hill in East Lothian entitled Mary Queen of Tarts. Colin Stuart Stevenson to be called by Claire Baker. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. It's perhaps no surprise that given that the first Director General, that wouldn't have been his title then, of the BBC was a doer Presbyterian Scot, uh, Lord Reith, that the original motto uh, of the BBC was nation shall speak peace unto nation, which is an adaptation from the book of Micah, uh, chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, the BBC was innovative when it started, and it remains innovative in the modern digital age. Uh, Jackson Carlaw wasn't entirely incorrect in his response to my attempted intervention. Uh, I appeared on the BBC on the shores of Loch Ern when Jackson Carlaw was three years old. Uh, but of course, Jackson Carlaw missed some of the most spectacular and impressive pieces of broadcasting that the BBC used to do. And the one which, uh, in his failure to accept an intervention, he showed most deeply uh, that omission was, of course, on the Sunday afternoon, the Brains Trust. So if he had uh, watched that, which was a, a wonderful programme, it was where Jakob Bronowski uh, was first brought to the public attention. And he probably produced, wrote, and was the inspiration of uh, my absolutely 
peak BBC programme, which was The Ascent of Man, uh, part of it actually moves me to tears. When he is standing in, uh, in uh, a concentration camp and he reaches down into a puddle and picks up the mud from the puddle and lo just looks at it and then looks at the camera and says, this is my family. There is no more stirring piece of television than Jakob Bronowski, who came to us uh, via the Brains Trust, which only the BBC, in all honesty, uh, could have uh, considered bringing. Um, now, of course, it may be that it's another member of the Brains Trust that Jackson Carlo is related to, uh, that uh, Tory MP, uh, Gerald Nabarro. Uh, he will be hoping, if he remembers anything about him, that he's not. The BBC also, of course, uh, has the affection of people on these benches for a program which was first broadcast on the 24th of November 1962. Uh, that was the week that was. It brought us uh, David Frost for the first time. It brought us the wonderful cartoonist, Timothy Birdsall. But fundamentally what it brought us was a satirical venue in which it was possible to probe the declining uh, strength of the then Conservative government under Harold Macmillan and probably contributed quite significantly uh, to the ending of that period of Tory rule. So we have a lot to be grateful for uh, to the BBC. And of course, the, that was the week that was. As a youngster, I was particularly grateful to because it was late on a Saturday night and I was allowed to stay up to watch it for the first time that late. So it was a wonderful program for me. But it also illustrated something that we've kind of lost in modern broadcasting. It actually was of a length that was appropriate to what was going on in the world that week. In other words, if there was more going on, the program just kept going because it was live. It, some of it was actually improvised on, uh, during the course of the program. And I think the rigid uh, timetables that box off programs today mean we've lost some of the spontaneity uh, and spark uh, that we had uh, from that uh, program. Let me just say a few uh, general things. The BBC produces one of the first the best current affairs programs that comes from Scotland, and it's done so for some time, and that's Yorpa. Um, it is subtitled, but it is a Gaelic program, and of course it enables us to look through Scottish eyes at things that are going on elsewhere, particularly in Europe, but occasionally uh, beyond. And only the BBC has the option to do that kind of program. So we really love the BBC for the things it's able to do. It's able to uh, pick up difficult subjects, it's able to bring them to us. Now, I want to just make a, a couple of points uh, which I hope the BBC, who will be watching this, I'm sure, will take on board. BBC Scotland's Radio Scotland is the poor relation, not simply in terms of the funding and resources that are made available to us, it's actually poor relation in terms of how it's delivered to us in the modern digital age. DAB radio that BBC Scotland is on is not delivered via any of the BBC multiplexes. It's delivered on commercial multiplexes. There are two effects that stem from that. One of which is if you're in a car with a DAB radio, it won't retune from multiplex to multiplex as you go across Scotland. Whereas all the London BBC radio channels, you can continue to listen across Scotland uh, because uh, of, of that. It also, because of that doesn't have an FM fallback. If you lose the digital signal, there isn't enough information provided to your radio set to allow it to fall back to FM, like uh, Radio 4 does. Radio 4 is one of the crowning glories of the BBC, and many of us in Scotland, like myself, listen to it. But it has its failings in relation to Scotland and in relation to the rest of the UK. I give one example in the very brief time that's left. I was listening to a piece on Radio 4 about Sunday trading in England and comments that were being made and how the world would fall apart if uh, shops were allowed to open ad lib on Sundays. No reference was made to the fact uh, for English audiences that in Scotland we'd had Sunday trading for many years and the world hadn't collapsed. But even more fundamentally for Scots listeners, there was no explanation of what the situation in England was in relation to Sunday trading. I didn't quite understand it until I went home and looked it up. So it both failed to represent Scotland in an English debate and failed to explain an English issue, which was of interest to us in a Scottish context. 
That is simply a metropolitan error that the BBC uh, has to address. Let's hope the BBC continue uh, to reflect the world to Scotland, but also to reflect Scotland to the world. Presiding officer. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Claire Baker to be followed by Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I'm pleased to speak in this afternoon's debate and I welcome the focus the Scottish Parliament is giving to the BBC and the greater engagement we are having with the BBC and BBC Scotland. I think we are developing a more mature and transparent relationship and that is to be welcomed. Um, indeed, when George Adam and I hosted the BBC showing of the Doctor Who Christmas special in Parliament last year, even the most sceptical BBC grudging MSP rushed for tickets. So I'm pleased we can all recognise the value of the BBC when we are presented with a quality product. The BBC is a valued and trusted institution. Its origins are rooted in the aims of educating, entertaining and informing its audience. And generations have grown up watching and enjoying BBC content. Founded in 1922, it is now competing in a very much changed media environment and a more competitive and commercial market, presenting big challenges for the organisation and its audience. But it is admired throughout the world as a public sector broadcaster, funded by all of us uh, and one which produces quality programming with a depth and a breadth not matched by any other broadcaster. And while the headlines this afternoon are all about the Charter, we can't forget this is a very challenging financial settlement for the BBC. Um, I don't agree that the BBC should fully cover the cost of the over 75 licence fee, which will be the primary factor in their budget reducing by almost 20% by 2020-21. The BBC faces a decade of declining resources, and while I fully support their role as a public sector broadcaster and the continuing use of the licence fee model, we need to also recognise the need for them to operate commercially and be able to generate income when appropriate. Uh, there is much to be welcomed in the BBC draft charter. I know the Cabinet Secretary has raised a number of areas which she feels haven't been delivered, but she shouldn't sell herself short. Um, at the start of the process, Ms Hislop set out to get a good deal for Scotland, to get political consensus on the way forward, and to champion the importance of BBC Scotland content. And any fair measure of the draft would say that she has achieved this. Um, for example, a service licence agreement for Scotland, a commitment to continue to support for Gaelic, a dedicated board member for Scotland, and a significant new public purpose to reflect, represent and serve the nations and the regions. Um, the Scottish Government may not have got the full result that they wanted, but it is a result that I feel reflects the views of this Parliament. And the recommendations of the previous Education and Culture Committee report are reflected in the draft charter, recommendations which grew the broadest support from the Parliament, and it is right for determining the direction of a public sector broadcaster. Uh, the level of Scottish content and spend will no doubt continue to be an issue of debate in Scotland. How much is commissioned in Scotland and how much is spent in Scotland? Um, these are figures which need to be available and fully discussed. Um, but I'd like to say a few things about these issues. Um, firstly, it is good news that a new drama commissioner and a new comedy commissioner have been announced for Scotland. A new drama development fund will be established and Scotland will be identified as a BBC centre of excellence in factual production. Uh, these are all to be welcomed and will make better use of the fantastic talent that we have, uh, build experience, confidence and relationships and secure more Scottish productions and crucially more opportunities for network productions originating in Scotland. Uh, we do have strengths in our current um, productions. A few weeks ago, I was at the recording of The Dog Ate My Homework at um, Pacific Quay, and you can look out for me in the school disco section of that programme. Really? But it was a very good... <laughs> it was a very good... I don't know if you've seen the programme. It has a specific school disco section where parents and children have to stand up and dance, and um, it's on uh, BBC... Uh, the CBBC, so you should look out for it when it comes. Uh, but it, it's a very good, I think the children's programme is a very good example of Scotland's strength um, in children's programming. It's an area in which BBC Scotland excels. Uh, we should all be very proud of the areas where we are being successful and are taking a lead and have the confidence and the necessary investment to grow and going forward. So it is welcome that the Charter says in commissioning and delivering output, the BBC should invest in the creative economies of each of the nations and contribute to their development. A clear statement which will support this activity and we all have a responsibility to make sure that that is delivered on. Um, secondly, I don't support the arguments around the share of the licence fee. 
it is an indicator of activity, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Um, I think we all agree that lift and shift is a, is a system that needed to be addressed and that the quotas need to be filled in a more meaningful way. But the reliance on an interpretation of the licence fee is not the right way to do this. Comparing Scotland's share to Wales or Northern Ireland's share is not comparing like with like for a number of reasons, um, including population difference for a start. Also, the breadth of network programming is a strong argument against a percentage licence fee figure being calculated for BBC Scotland and is an attempt at federalisation of the BBC by the back door. This would be a blunt figure which does not reflect what we get in return for the licence fee. Full BBC programming, radio, iPlayer, website and it is right and fair that a proportion of our licence fee contributes towards that. To create an internal market for these services would be a disaster and not in the best interest of the licence fee payer who is completely ignored in these discussions. Audiences should be at the heart of the debate and a look at any of the viewing figures for match of the day or for Strictly Come Dancing show that people in Scotland value these programmes as much as anywhere else and we all benefit from being part of the UK network. And thirdly, the BBC is built on shared values throughout the UK. Its funding model, its founding principles, its innovation and commitment to quality give all of us as a country a public sector broadcast that is rivaled, unrivaled around the world and that is to be very much valued. Thank you. Tavish Scott to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Can I say I entirely agreed with much of Claire Baker's remarks, although I have to confess I am heartily relieved not to have to watch CBBCs anymore. Uh, although there'll be a, day, a, st a stage later on in life, no doubt, when that may happen again, but at the moment I, can, I could uh, happily see it far, far, far enough. The um, presiding officer, can I start by apologising for having to leave early this evening due to a number of transport related challenges in my, uh, in my life, but, uh, and therefore apologise to the front benches for not being able to, be able to stay for the final contribution this afternoon but what I did want to do is just reflect a number of points firstly I thought the cabinet secretary set out uh, a pretty fair assessment of the situation I also want to genuinely say that I think the tone of the uh, of the government front bench on this matter on this really important issue of the BBC and the Charter has uh, has improved greatly from my perspective I thought Fiona Hislop made a, a very constructive and sensible speech uh, this afternoon and that's uh, to be welcome given the importance of this matter but Lewis MacDonald was right to set some context for this debate I mean no government can ever uh, resist and I mean no government can ever resist the temptation to seek to interfere in the broadcaster who is funded by uh, the licence uh, fee payer and by definition therefore the voter. It, is, it happens all over the world, it happens uh, regularly and it's happened under successive Westminster governments of all political persuasions. So uh, I do want to reflect the fact that um, Lewis MacDonald made a pretty fair point there about a number of Conservative governments over the years that I've watched who have grotesquely interfered in the editorial uh, uh, importance of the BBC and I'm very glad to see that now not happening and I hope that long may uh, that uh, continue because the, if we are to allow uh, a broadcaster and for that matter the BBC does so much more than just broadcast but to develop and flourish and particularly as Fiona Hislop rightly said uh, be a very important part of the creative industries not I may say just in Scotland but right around uh, the UK then it is an essential part of allowing that organisation to flourish that it not be um, interfered with by uh, any government of any uh, political persuasion and it is to the credit of the Scottish Government and of the UK Government now if they, can, if they do recognise that very important distinction which Fiona has not rightly drew out uh, of of course commenting on spend and on investment uh, and on uh, how programmes uh, come to be seen in different parts of the country of course uh, making observations about all those things and indeed pushing very hard for greater investment in uh, the important aspects of the BBC's uh, service across the country uh, but to separate that very very clearly from uh, the importance of editorial uh, independence. Fiona Hislop, the Cabinet Secretary, rather, raised um, three important points, I think, in her introductory remarks. Uh, one around more representative content uh, and about the creative industries, which I've very briefly touched on. Uh, the one I would, uh, would just hesitate to suggest the government just needs to be a little reflective on is the calls for ever, ever greater decentralised decision making. Now that principle is admirable, but uh, all of us who preach that, uh, preach that uh, the, 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 the uh, approach of decentralisation need to carry it through into everything we do. And I have been on the end as a constituency member of lots of decisions being taken away from my part of the world by a government who have centralised. So uh, by all means make the argument for decentralisation within the BBC, but please also consistently do that in how government operates uh, as well. Um, can I also, of course, yeah. Fiona Hislop. Would the member reflect, I think, on Lewis McDonald's point that it's all very well having commissioners on drama and on comedy, but the issue is, would you have then 
um, decision making on budgets to help support that. And I think that's really the core of the test that we want to make. Tavish Scott. I'm very happy to come to, back to that point. I thought uh, there's one additional point I wanted to make, but certainly uh, he or she who controls the budget, of course, uh, uh, has a, a major uh, uh, effect on the effectiveness of the roles that the uh, Cabinet Secretary has uh, outlined. Uh, the other point I wanted to just make in the context of the creative industries is I think it is a strength of Scottish broadcasting that STV are not only there, but push the BBC really hard, both in terms of news production. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, you're very well aware of this uh, a particular argument is you mem memorably host breakfasts for STV uh, in Parliament and rightly so those are good events in which STV's own management team can be questioned but my point is that that STV uh, are uh, good for the BBC because they push really hard and and the, the point that has been made about the Scottish Seven uh, is important in that context although I think the, uh, the surely the objective test we always apply to that is the quality uh, of that uh, of that that will be uh, with us on our screens uh, next year and also where it's good to be seen because I understand there's a fairly significant issue about that too. But so for Radio 2, the independent radio stations around Scotland are uh, equally as important in pushing uh, BBC Radio and BBC Radio Scotland uh, in its quality and its output and its news gathering uh, abilities. So competition is important both in the broadcasting news and entertainment markets uh, as well. I'm grateful to those who have highlighted the role of the Smith Commission in driving forward much of uh, or some of these uh, uh, or the principle of what uh, needed to happen here in terms of governance and the role. And I believe, as I believe Joan McAlpine mentioned, that the previous Culture Committee in the, in the last session of Parliament deserve much credit for a series of recommendations which, as far as I can see, have broadly been uh, encapsulated in the, in the new Charter. And the Government have obviously played an important role in that, but it is occasionally important to recognise the role of a committee in terms of how it has uh, brought things to pass. Now, um, Fiona Hisop rightly mentioned, the, uh, and as, as did Claire Baker as well, the Drama Commissioner and New Comedy Commissioner. In addition to the point that the Cabinet Secretary makes about the budget, it does strike me as important that those individuals will be there because their jobs will depend on how much they can also get onto the network, how much they actually achieve uh, within the BBC. And the fact that they are pushing a Scottish um, quality uh, and a Scottish approach to uh, both comedy and to drama, I think is a very positive development, as is the Drama Development Fund that, that has been mentioned too. To, uh, one final point, if I may, uh, presiding officer, by, by, way of, uh, by way of example. I, I believe one of the big challenge to the BBC is to invest in news uh, and the news gathering in Scotland to a greater extent, particularly in terms of the support for journalists. Because as we contrast today with, and I, I graze news in the morning, today Five Live and, and uh, GMS, I contrast uh, when the BBC brought Jim Nockey up Nochty up to co-present GMS through the events of 2014. He was supported in the same way that he would be supported in the Today programme. I would hope that in future, BBC Scotland would find the people, the resources and the research to put behind the excellent quality of broadcasters we have, but to make sure those programmes have more depth and reach than they currently do. Stuart McMillan, followed by Ross Greer. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, at the outset, actually, I just want to touch upon the comments from uh, Jackson Carlaw and uh, Tabby Scott there, actually, and uh, his uh, contribution. Uh, certainly, Jackson Carlaw spoke uh, regarding the, the Smith Commission proposals uh, and uh, the input uh, that Scotland and, and this Parliament now has in the BBC. But clearly, this is something that I, I warmly welcome, uh, although uh, I certainly have thought for many, many years that, uh, certainly since this Parliament was re-established, that surely this Parliament actually should have had that level of input going back to 1999 as compared to just starting uh, now. But I do generally warmly welcome the fact that we now do have uh, that input into the BBC. But presenting also that the BBC is a hugely important cultural institution and it remains the single most important contributor to public service broadcasting uh, in the UK. And it plays an important role in supporting the, the wider creative economy, both directly through commissioning from the independent production sector and also indirectly through investment in skills and training. I've heard ex examples today of, of programmes uh, that in terms of across Scotland and certainly Joe McAlpine was talking about Waterloo Road. And, and I know that uh, whilst the programme uh, was there, despite the fact that it was lifted and shifted, uh, very much kind of a false situation, but whilst it was uh, based in Greenock, uh, in, in the, the old uh, Greenock Academy School, it certainly had uh, a positive effect upon uh, the Inverclyde economy. Uh, although, unfortunately, uh, there hasn't been a longer-lasting uh, effect uh, in, terms of, in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, in increased training. But in relation... Sure, OK. Joan McAlpine. Yeah, 
somebody who comes from Greenock, myself, um, I would want to endorse the points that you've just made, and I know it did make a big effect uh, on the economy, and that's really to be welcomed. But does he agree with me that having a commissioner of, of drama with real power and a budget will perhaps ensure that we have a returnable drama series from Scotland that, that isn't axed because the plot line isn't particularly credible? <laughs> Stuart McMillan. And it's, yeah, I mean, it was certainly, it generally was a beneficial thing uh, and program uh, for the economy, but we need to have that longer term vision and that longer term planning and having that commissioner, uh, as uh, Joe McAlpine discussed, certainly would, uh, would aid that going forward. But certainly in relation, presenting officer, uh, to audience reach, BBC Trust referred to data indicating that BBC television in Scotland is consumed by a higher proportion of the population than for the rest of the UK. Uh, and we now have a, a new charter which I do welcome, but I also I can't help but feel that the proposals represent something of a missed opportunity, namely that they do not deliver fully for the Scottish audience. Now, the Scottish Government supports the ambitions of, B of BBC Scotland staff to be a high quality broadcaster for the people and population of Scotland, but their ambitions will only be realised with increased investment and the decentralisation of commissioning authority away from Broadcasting House in London to Pacific Quay. Uh, also, the UK has changed dramatically since devolution, but the BBC has yet to fully catch up with the impact of devolution and truly reflect the complex, varied and rich realities of our society. And the independence referendum energised Scotland in 2014, prompting a record 85% turnout uh, as our population engaged with politics on a level never previously seen. The, that consensual democratic process played out on the world stage with audiences and governments from far and wide taking an interest in Scotland's future, our values and also our culture. But through this and the global coverage of the Glasgow 2014 uh, Commonwealth Games, Scotland engaged extensively with the world. But Scotland has clear and distinct needs and it's vital uh, that the requirements of our audiences, our production sector and those in our wider creative industries are also met. Uh, the Scottish Government's proposals lay out measures for increased transparency and accountability, which will help the corporation listen to and reflect its audiences. A key concern raised by production companies is that the commissioning process for network television has too much of a London focus. And this is we heard it today and also last week in committee. Now, they have said that proximity is a crucial factor and that it can be difficult for Scottish companies to win commissions because the centralised model with ultimate decision making lying in London puts Scottish companies at a disadvantage. Now, a federal structure would have empowered the BBC to better reflect the needs of the nations and regions it serves, giving BBC Scotland full control over decision making in terms of how revenue raised here is actually spent. But full control over commissioning and editorial decisions would have had an enormously positive impact. It's evident that substantial change is still required for the commissioning process to grow the strong, sustainable and competitive creative industries, uh, industry, industry, industry sector in Scotland that we actually seek. Now, a greater degree of decentralisation uh, of and also the accountability for commissioning and accompanying budgets across the nations and regions would certainly uh, rebalance the concern the BBC uh, actually has a, a London bias. But it should also, it should, it should actually benefit the creative industries in Scotland by attracting, developing and retaining talent, thus helping the sector become strong, sustainable and also competitive. And it's not just enough to improve access to commissioners, welcome although that may be. But implementing these improvements would not necessarily require the BBC to adopt a federal structure as such, but would require even greater decentralisation of decision-making, commissioning, and also these accompanying budgets. And it would enable BBC Scotland to take that longer-term strategic approach to delivering sustainable, high-quality programming that benefits audiences, the, the global market, and the creative sector. And this could actually be a win-win for viewers both in Scotland and across the rest of the UK. And a fairer share of the licence fee money raised in Scotland, being spent in Scotland, could also deliver up to an additional £100 million of investment uh, and also uh, supporting up to 1,500 jobs and contributing an additional £60 million to the Scottish economy. And I'm conscious of time, uh, presiding officer. So with that, I'll just I'll conclude on this. Uh, I actually do value the BBC and I do want it to succeed. However, whilst I welcome the, the, this new charter uh, and the uh, really support pledged close. for better representation of Scotland as a nation, the creative economy and the provision of the Gaelic language, then the charter needs to be the starting point Mr. for McMillan, an improved you BBC must close. in Scotland. Thank you.
I call on Ross Greer to be followed by Alexander Anderson. Sorry. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The BBC is regularly said to be far more than, a sum, uh, than the sum of its parts, and this is true. There really is no comparison anywhere else in the world. No other public service broadcaster which offers such a variety of content across different mediums and to every corner of the world. Jackson Carl has already mentioned the service provided by the BBC World Service. And it's a highly valued institution, up there with the NHS in the consciousness of people across these islands. And yet, here in Scotland, where support for public services and the principle of public service broadcasting is so high, there are some deep-seated uh, dissatisfactions with the broadcaster. And I'm not referring to conspiracy theories or tilted weather maps. There are widespread and legitimate concerns in Scotland about both the nature of BBC content being delivered here and the commissioning and production process itself, one which seems to not deliver for the production industry that we have here in Scotland. Only 48% of people here believe the BBC is good at representing their life in news and current affairs. This compares to 55% in Wales and just over 60% in England and Northern Ireland. Now, none of those numbers are as high as we want them to be, but it is notable that in Scotland, that number has fallen below the halfway mark. Given the reach of the BBC in Scotland, more than half of adults watch its news and current affairs programmes each week, there is a responsibility to provide high quality programming which reflects the world that the audience lives in and which the audience can have confidence in. And I'm concerned that through the debate around BBC content in Scotland, we have though focused quite narrowly on news and current affairs output. The breadth of what the BBC offers here goes far beyond reporting Scotland, GMS and Scotland 2016. And even within this narrow debate, as has already been mentioned, when debating BBC content, we uh, get focused on news and current affairs. And when we focus on news and current affairs, we too often then focus on the principle, the idea of a Scottish sex, a comprehensive news programme in Scotland. I'd enthusiastically welcome a Scottish sex. We're a nation with our own distinct politics, legal system, education system, health service. We've come a long way since devolution. And we're clearly in need of our main broadcaster and our largest media organisation to reflect that. Scotland has come a long way, but the BBC has not seized this opportunity. It's fallen behind the curve in representing Scotland and our place in the world to audiences here and elsewhere. I should say that I don't hold any grudge against the network news. It naturally leads with stories which have a major impact on or a major interest from a significant majority of its audience. But that's where the problem lies. UK-wide evening news programmes won't often be leading with reports from what happens in this parliament, and nor should they be. But viewers in Scotland deserve a service which reflects the reality of the world that they live in. And with commercial rivals already announcing their intention, as Tavish Scott mentioned, to provide this fully rounded Scottish news service, I'm sure we would all welcome further progress from BBC Scotland. And progress is particularly needed on engaging with younger audiences. Given that the average age of a Radio Scotland listener is 53 and more than half of BBC Scotland's news audience is over 55, there is clearly much work that we need to do to ensure that BBC services in Scotland are sustainable, that the audience is sustainable. Since the independence referendum, Scotland has seen a welcome rise in new media outlets such as Common Space, who have engaged very successfully with young people, particularly online. And BBC Scotland has made a significant effort to expand its online presence, but much more is required for its reach to be sustainable over the coming years. The BBC in Scotland does not exist only to provide news and current affairs output, of course, as I've already mentioned. And nor would we expect all of the content produced here for the BBC to be specifically or inherently Scottish. Whilst we have many notable successes which are distinctly Scottish, including Shetland, which is airing everywhere from Finland to the United States at the moment, there are plenty of success stories here which have no intrinsic attachment to our nation. They're just quality programmes produced by the talented and vibrant creative industry that we have here. Robot Wars, for example, in my own region, or Question Time, which is now produced in Scotland. Though I would say that the quality of question time and audience satisfaction lie far more heavily with the guests invited than the production team behind the programme. But the reality is that investment in Scotland is strikingly low, as Joan McAlpine has already mentioned. For every pound raised here through the licence fee, only 55 pence is spent here. 
That compares to 75 pence in Northern Ireland and 95 pence in Wales if you exclude spending on S4C. Now, I wouldn't expect spending to reach 100%. That's not how this works, and Clearbreaker outlined that very well. And it's true that spending varies from year to year. But given that spending in 2014-15 was equivalent to 63 pence in the pound, in the year of so many major events happening in Scotland, it's clear that we're not close to what many of us would consider a satisfactory arrangement in Scotland. And often those figures don't tell the full story. It's already been mentioned that in evidence to the Culture and Europe Committee, we found that significant amounts of snooker being produced in Sheffield was going towards the Scottish production quota, simply due to a couple of desks at the BBC's headquarters in Pacific Quay. And it was also disappointing to hear during our evidence session that production companies in Scotland felt that uh, companies from outside were being offered longer term contracts to entice them into Scotland, whereas indigenous companies were not being offered those same opportunities. There are a huge number of ways that the BBC is already pledged to make significant improvements. The Charter has a number of welcome steps, and there are a number of other improvements that will be made outside the Charter process. I really hope that an institution that we all deeply value can bring about the necessary changes to ensure that as a secure future with satisfied audiences in Scotland and across these islands. The very understanding, Mr Stewart, to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Delighted to participate in this debate today, and it's been great to listen to many of the reflections of members in the Chamber about uh, their input from the BBC and the programmes uh, and events that have uh, taken part in their lives. Included in the BBC's remit of duty, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, is the idea of looking at nations, regions and communities, and that reflects what happens across the United Kingdom. And prior to the, the to review taking place, there was an acknowledgement uh, that that had somehow and somehow fallen short uh, in the whole point of broadcasting within regard to Scotland. Scotland uh, and the way in which she is governed has changed dramatically over the past 17 years uh, since the advent of devolution. And we must now look at the new powers that are coming to this parliament because it will give us even more responsibility on taxation and more responsibility on expenditure. And the BBC must adopt these uh, new political dimensions and reflect them as they move forward. There's no doubt that uh, debates on transforming schools south of the border or industrial action on junior doctors has little relevance to many people here within Scotland if that's appearing on the BBC. We must ensure that debates over the education system here in Scotland and the health service are ones that are being promoted uh, on the BBC that are much more relevant uh, to the listener or, or the person viewing them on the television. The issue of the Charter Renewal is, for these reasons, incredibly important as we move forward in, our, uh, in the debate within Scotland. I was therefore very pleased, Deputy Presiding Officer, to hear that the UK Government's Department of Culture, Media and Sport had sought to consult widely during the review, and particularly uh, to take on board the accounts from what's happening within the devolved organisations and, and parliaments and assemblies. The fact that the Charter enshrines the, the community uh, and the memorandums of understanding that reflects between the Scottish Government, the BBC uh, and the Department of Culture, Media and Sport is, I believe, a good example of positive intergovernmental cooperation. And that's what we need, positive cooperation. This is the type of collaboration that everybody in Scotland wants to see more of because it does make a massive impact uh, on all of us. The fact that the BBC will now have to lay its accounts before the Scottish Parliament can only be a good thing, Deputy Presiding Officer, because that increases the scrutiny and the effectiveness of what is taking place uh, across uh, the public sector here. While the crucial parts of the BBC uh, and the accounts that are being spent, large sums of money or public money are being spent, and we need to ensure that that is uh, being protected. And it cannot uh, be allowed for editorial uh, independence to be removed uh, and for government political uh, infringements to take place. So it, it, it was quite interesting though, uh, Deputy President Officer, when we had some uh, uh, of the consultations that there were some overtones uh, from parts of, uh, of that that verged on advocating that state control might be something that should be looked at. Uh, and, and, and that uh, I felt was uh, taking it a step far too far. 
Uh, the new charter will, uh, will also give the BBC Scotland data control over the budget and commissioning that it can produce more programmes specifically for Scottish audiences. And these programmes must reflect the diversity, the ethnic minorities that we have, and also disabilities for people in Scotland. Because that is something that we do not see as much as we should see uh, within uh, uh, the sector. Uh, and that's very important that that does take place. The new commissioning editors for both television, comedy and drama in Scotland, coupled with the new drama development fund, will be helped to promote new programmes for talent uh, that we can see across the sector. Moreover, the BBC produces some of the best programmes, and many people today, dear presiding officer, have touched on some of these fantastic programmes that take place. They are there to ensure that we are making the best of what we have for the licence fee that we're given. Uh, the television channels and the radio stations that we have uh, are quite uh, in, in remarkable in moving things forward, dear presiding officer, and that for us is, is very important. The world is changing and as you move into a more digital age and the BBC both in Scotland and the rest of the UK must adapt to create more wishes for the people and give them more access and more control. The BBC is able to compete across the, uh, the sectors uh, and technology is a massive opportunity uh, for us to ensure that we have high quality performance and programmes that are renowned throughout the United Kingdom. And many have been discussed already today, dear President Officer, that are real flagships of Scotland uh, and show us to the UK, Europe and the world uh, as to where we are. Uh, in moving forward, uh, we need to look at uh, how, how we balance that and ensure that we get the right balance uh, so that we are reflecting what is being done within the process and moving forward. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I very much welcome the provisions uh, that have come forward today and I look forward to reflecting to see that in modern times, socially, digitally and politically, we need to be bold. We need to have that courage of moving forward and showing us that we have high regard for the BBC. Scotland has a big part to play and we can all look forward to the months and years ahead because they will be good, I have no doubt. Thank you. The last of the closing speeches is Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Um, many of the points that I will make are related to what others have said, but I do have a wee bit of a different angle, though, and it is worth reiterating a lot of the points because it shows a consensus across the Chamber. So I am pleased to contribute today, and I welcome the Scottish Parliament's new, if not overdue, official role of the Charter process. When our previous director of the BBC Scotland, Ken Macquarie, appeared before the European and External Relations Committee recently, he encouraged stakeholders to be robust in their critique of the BBC to ensure an open debate. It is in that spirit in which I will proceed today. The Scottish people and this Scottish government value the vital role the BBC plays as a public service broadcaster. However, for too long, the BBC has not been working for the people of Scotland. The total licence fee, the income in Scotland is for uh, 2014 and 15 was approximately £323 million. I know people have put that forward as a percentage, but it's £323 million. But yet the BBC spend attributed to Scotland for the same period equaled only £190.5 million. So as the budget falls in Scotland, so does viewer satisfaction. Figures from BBC Scotland's own annual report show satisfaction rate, rates as low as 48%, and Ross Greer has uh, mentioned this already. But yet the cuts continue. By the end of 2017, the BBC Scotland's only budget will have suffered a cut of 16 million in cash terms over five years. When disappointment is expressed in these figures, we are often told by the BBC management in London that Scottish audiences consume a high level of network programming, like the Olympics, which has been mentioned of football, and that we must pay for this with some of our licence fee revenue. However, now that we have access to the information provided in the BBC accounts for the first time, this argument is easily dismantled. We now know that in Wales, the BBC spends at least 95% of the licence fee revenue at races from Welsh licence fee payers. Northern Ireland spends 75% of what it races, and it is estimated that England spends well over 100%. In light of this, I put it to the BBC that one reason for high consumption of UK-wide network content in Scotland may be the lack of any alternative in the form of distinctive Scottish programming. 
There is a continuing hypocrisy represented by savage cuts taking place in Scotland, while budgets across many services in England and the rest of the UK are maintained. This was highlighted when budget cuts led to a substantial number of journalists being forced to take redundancy just months before Scotland's historic referendum. The end result was that at a time when BBC Scotland should have been demanding more money from the BBC centrally, it was instead accepting less. Mr Macquarie is now the BBC's Director of Nations and Regions. And while I wish him well in his new role, I wonder how he will square presiding over Wales, England and Northern Ireland being allowed the privilege of spending the money they raise while his former colleagues at BBC Scotland continue under the spectre of further cuts and potential job losses. In terms of employment, commissioning, which was mentioned by Stuart Macmillan, is another contentious, contentious issue which has been raised with the committee by independent production companies. The use of and I'm going to say this really slowly so that I don't make a gaffe. The use of lift and shift, as Joan McAlpin and Jackson Carlow mentioned, the use of lift and shift to fulfil quotas is undoubtedly harming indie companies. Employment in production in Scotland fell by 27% between 2012 and 2015 because network programming temporarily decamped to Scotland to meet quotas and it does not provide sustainable employment, nor is it conducive to the creation of programming which nurtures and reflects our distinctive heritage and cultures. When we can't provide an envir environment in which those who wish to work in creative sectors can find sustainable employment in Scotland, people will go elsewhere. And I'm sure everyone across the chamber can agree that we don't want talented people to be forced to leave Scotland. People who want to live and work here should have the opportunity to do so. It is now clearer than ever that real change will only come when funding and commissioning authority comes to BBC Scotland. Cabinet Minister mentioned creation of a Scottish board. So now is the time for the creation of a Scottish board, not just a BBC appointed subcommittee to allow BBC Scotland greater control over its budget to be given meaningful commissioning power. If Scotland's share of licence fee revenue raised here was in line with Wales, at least an additional 128 million per annum would be spent by the BBC in Scotland. Imagine what we would be capable of with the same resources available to us as our neighbours across the UK. And perhaps some of the extra revenue could be channelled into the draft charter's new public purpose. So again, I know people have mentioned this already, and Claire Baker said this as well as others. So we're going to reflect and raise awareness of the different cultures throughout the nations and regions. And the regions is really important. As current president of Dumfries Ladies Burns Club number one, I'm all for this. And today is National Poetry Day. So we could be doing a lot more poetry events. And so we'll see more, more Scots poetry and all that. So pre presiding officer, it seems difficult to envisage how all of this is going to be achieved with current funding levels. BBC Alba is an excellent example of the standard of programming that can be achieved and has been achieved thus far on a shoestring budget. In the current financial year, BBC Alba received 9.9 million and the BBC spends 10 times more than that on S4C in Wales. I hope this chamber will support the number of sensible close, proposals I'm in my last sentence. The sensible Hope it's a short one. It is <laughs> contained within the Scottish Government's policy paper and that we can continue to work together to create a new and improved BBC Scotland. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Lewis MacDonald. Um, six minutes, please, Mr MacDonald. Thank you very much. And we have heard a great deal today about the real issues we should focus on over the term of the next BBC Charter to 2027. There are plenty of challenges ahead for the BBC and challenges too for this Parliament in supporting the kind of developments which will enhance the cultural life and the creative economy of Scotland. Increased support for Gaelic broadcasting, more Scottish content in radio and online are just some of those that we have highlighted today. Fiona Hislop began by saying that the Scottish Government has pursued a consensus approach and I think that's uh, broadly to be welcomed. Joan McAlpine also began by endorsing that, but it was disappointing she didn't find anything more positive to say uh, about the BBC's evidence to the Culture Committee last week. 
Anne Bulford made some important points that should be welcomed. For example, about how the pattern of BBC spending as we go through the 11-year charter will change and how opening up the whole production base to competition over the course of the charter would create new opportunities, not least for independent production companies in Scotland. Of course. John McAlpin. I think I was clear that I did, wel I did welcome the Charter and uh, the framework that it sets out, but does he not agree with me that there is certainly a belief that it's important to hold the senior management of the BBC to account to make sure that they abide by the spirit uh, of the Charter and, that, and some, that there are some doubts about that within the BBC and certainly within the independent production sector? Well, indeed, and, Lewis and, and, and Ken Macquarie, in his evidence, uh, hi uh, highlighted the achievements under the existing charter. And he said, I take the criticism that has been offered in an open spirit and accept that there are areas where we have to do better. So I agree that that open spirit and positive engagement will be very important for this parliament's scrutiny of the BBC in the period ahead. But I think that open spirit has to come uh, from both sides in that protest process. The context of this debate is that the BBC serves the whole of the United Kingdom. That uh, is clear in the terms of the Charter. But it is directed now to do so in a way which better reflects the diversity of our communities, which is welcome. That does not mean moving away from a UK-wide network. And I do not accept, for example, the point that was made that a programme reporting a sporting event in England should not be counted somehow as a Scottish production, as long as the production company making that programme is substantially Scotland-based. What is important for our debate is that there are agreed criteria as to what constitutes Scottish contact, contact and what constitutes uh, a substantial base, and that these criteria are accepted uh, and applied by all interested parties. It is not, I think, helpful to offer subjective judgments about degrees of Scottishness, uh, as if uh, some production companies based in Scotland are somehow more Scottish than others. And there is no good reason why a Scottish company cannot make a programme in England. Quite the contrary, nor is there any need for Scottish programming to be programmes only about Scotland. As David Smith told the committee last week, we want to make representational content, but we do not want to make only representational content. We want to make Lewis, Grassic, Gibbon and Shakespeare all those things. It is wrong too, I think, to suggest, uh, as we heard this afternoon, that BBC Scotland is suffering cuts while the rest of the BBC is not. As Claire Baker said, those reduced budgets apply across the board and they are to be regretted uh, wherever they are impacting upon the BBC. Lift and shift has been controversial in the debate about meat and production quotas. And again, we heard a number of comments about that this afternoon. It is important that those quotas deliver their ultimate objective of sustaining Scotland's creative economy. But it would be wrong to suggest that incentivising companies to move here from elsewhere in the UK uh, is always somehow uh, a failure. David Strachan did indeed give examples to the committee of where lift and shift did not work. But he also uh, made the point that career paths had been created by some such programmes, for example, in the production of Homes Under the Hammer. And David Smith described how Mentor Media had lifted and shifted question time to Scotland, and in doing so, they had invested substantially here and created a genuinely Scottish business as a result. And I was uh, uh, pleased to meet Ron Jones from that company uh, at a recent conference uh, in Edinburgh. Yes. Stuart McMillan. Taking the, the intervention. Uh, I'm sure Lewis MacDonald will agree that uh, it's, it's not so much the idea of lift and shift as a bad thing, but it's about when it does happen. There needs to be that, that, that proposed and that longer term, medium and longer term uh, uh, strategy actually and put, put in place as well. Uh, absolutely. Lewis and, 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 and rather than seeing lift and shift as permanently in competition with Scottish based production, I think we should see it as a transitional stage in enabling the Scottish production sector to grow and thrive. And of course, another issue highlighted today was whether a large enough share of the BBC's income from Scottish licence fees was being spent in Scotland. I think it is, as Claire Baker said, fair to use that as a measurement, but it seems to me a mistake to use that as a target. The BBC is a single corporation serving the nations and regions of the United Kingdom. It is not a series of separate companies sharing only a common brand. And there are, of course, many programmes made in Scotland which are not counted against these totals. The live screening of today's debate is paid for from the budget of BBC Parliament and is therefore neither output from BBC Scotland nor a Scottish production commissioned against the Ofcom criteria, but yet it is still programme making from Scotland. And so we should be careful uh, about not being too prescriptive uh, about how these things are measured. We want the BBC to produce the best programmes to support the greatest creativity 
and to promote the best talent. Those should be its targets to achieve quality production and not to aim for accountancy balances. The BBC, as has been said, plays a central role in the life of this country. It is as important to Scotland as to any other part of the United Kingdom and as highly valued. Like the United Kingdom itself, the BBC is evolving to reflect the increased role of the nations and regions of the UK in Britain's cultural life. That evolution is to be welcomed and supported. We believe that the way to do that is to work with the grain of the new draft char charter and framework agreement to encourage and enable Scotland's independent production sector and to support those within the BBC who see promotion of the nations and regions as their task over the next 11 years. I now call on Jamie Green, up to seven minutes, please, Mr Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we've enjoyed a very interesting uh, debate today with some excellent contributions from across the chamber, uh, highlighting the importance of the role of the BBC in Scotland's creative industries. Uh, having worked for 13 years in television myself, uh, including a stint at the BBC, I must share with the chamber that I was always struck by the dedica dedication of uh, BBC staff in creating innovative programming for the whole of the UK. I think there's a lot of consensus here, uh, consensus that we agree that BBC output has a tremendous impact on our lives on a daily basis. It entertains, it reports, it teaches, and it informs. And the BBC has gone through quite remarkable evolution from its first radio broadcasts in the 1920s uh, through to the 315 million iPlayer requests in just one month in 2016. But of course, a big part of what makes the BBC so appealing to so many is its diversity. Uh, and that is my point today. It is my opinion that creative industries work best when there are a variety of cultures, traditions and opinions to draw from. Now we know that 88% of BBC viewing in Scotland is of UK wide network content from the Archers to Doctor Who. And Scottish viewers and listeners, in my view, benefit from output that comes from across the UK, just as original production from Scotland is seen and sold the world over. I therefore welcome many of the Charter's proposals, namely the proposal to introduce a non-executive board member for Scotland, the commitment to ensuring that Scotland is a centre of excellence for factual production, and the introduction of new content commissioners that we've heard much about today in comedy and drama, and I'm sure more will follow. Uh, looking at some of the contributions made in the chamber today, now, Tiswas and Andy Pandy were way before my time, but I do feel quite enlightened by the nostalgia uh, in the chamber. Remarkable resemblance. Thank you. <laughs> I, like the Cabinet Secretary, uh, do welcome... <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> I, like the Cabinet Secretary, welcome advances in this charter, such as uh, the board member for Scotland, but having real tangible targets that we can monitor in this parliament. Uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary made also some excellent and relevant points about the importance of and spend in regional radio in Scotland as it compares to England, for example. Uh, my colleague, Jackson Carlaw, uh, mentioned that we can be fans of the BBC, but we do need to be critical where appropriate. And like many colleagues, he noted, noted the importance of the Smith Commission commitments for the future, raising the important issue that in, independent production houses and studios in Scotland need to be supported and that the government has a responsibility with that too. Uh, Lewis MacDonald quoted, I think it was an independent production company, saying it's not the end of the journey. This is a charter for 11 years, and I do agree with that. I also agree that all Scottish regions must be represented, uh, not just the central belt. Uh, John McAlpine picked up the point of employment in the production sector. You know, I was a freelance TV producer and I left Scotland uh, to seek the gold pavements of London many years ago to find work. Uh, so I do appreciate how difficult it is to find work as a freelance uh, television producer. Uh, so I do support any moves which come through to support uh, more employment in the sector in Scotland and encouraging companies to set up shop here in Scotland. But on the point of the licence fee and this talk of the 55% spend, I think it is very important that the Chamber remembers uh, that, that, that um, it is commissioning which drives budget. And I don't think we're looking at this in the right way. It is actually uh, part of a national licence fee scheme that overall benefits, benefits us from the viewing that we get to enjoy across BBC, television, radio and online. I will. John McAlpin. 
thank the member for taking the intervention. I, I totally agree that you know, we, we benefit from these productions that are right across the UK, but I think one of the points that was made at the committee was that these sorts of network productions that benefit the whole of the UK, too many of them are not made in the nations and regions. They're, they're focused on, on the, the South East and that we need to make sure that more of that production is actually made in the nations and regions. Jamie uh, Green. I, I, I thank the member for that point. I, I think uh, the important thing, therefore, is to ensure that these commissioning commitments are actually honoured and that more commissioning uh, is taken in Scotland. And I'm, I'm happy to agree with that point. Um, I, I think uh, Claire Baker did uh, make an interesting point that I think this quasi-federalisation of the BBC doesn't work in the spirit of the concept of the licence fee. Uh, and I'm happy to associate myself uh, with those comments. Uh, my colleague Rachel mentioned uh, a, a good point about online, uh, uh, that the BBC is developing nation homepages, uh, and there are some uh, technical um, changes coming out in the near future on that. I think that's important. Uh, BBC Online is a, an important place for, for news and, and entertainment. Um, Stuart Stevenson, as always, uh, made some interesting comments on his own appearances at the BBC. <laughs> Uh, but he did make a very moving, moving point about the ascent of man. I do, however, wonder if uh, he qualifies for deviation on subject under the rules of just a minute in his speech. Uh, just a minute with him. <laughs> uh, Tavish, Tavish Scott made a, a very uh, interesting point, uh, unfortunately he's, he's gone now, uh, about government control of the public broadcast sector. And I'd like to think uh, that um, uh, many improvements have been made in that respect over the years. Uh, Ross Greer made a, an interesting point about uh, satisfaction in output, and I think it is important that the BBC take note of uh, survey results like that, and I'm sure they will be striving to improve satisfaction results in the future. Uh, my colleague Alexander Stewart also reflected on the changing nature of Scottish uh, politics and, and, and governance, and that that should be reflected in BBC output, especially in news. He also mentioned diversity, and divers diversity has been used a lot in this chamber today. I think it's very important that we monitor uh, diversity uh, across um, various communities. Uh, overall, I consider these current proposals to be very positive steps. This charter, in my view, uh, represent, represents progress in promoting Scottish interests across the BBC. And its proposals do reflect the suggestions of this parliament. And that's a testament to the constructive deba debates we've had in this chamber, many before I joined this place. So I would like to acknowledge the BBC's commitment to appearing in front of and providing reports to this Parliament's committees. And I welcome the fact that the BBC is working closely with Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland to improve its accountability and to provide more diverse content for diverse audiences. In closing, uh, the BBC needs to ensure that its new targets on representation are met, and that is something this Parliament should monitor closely. There is still a great deal that can be done to better represent Scottish culture and its impact on the wider world. Presiding officer, I hope that further openness has been cultivated as a result of this process and today's debate. Thank you. Ms Hislop, I'll need to cut you down to about eight and a half minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, when we first started the debate, I was desperately and frantically trying to think if there's any of the TV programmes that were uh, important to Jackson Carlow that I shared, and I really struggled until he hit upon I, Claudius. Uh, so perhaps uh, there's something when I was a teenager of the political skullduggery and salacious uh, storylines that I share with Jackson Carlow. Um, a number of very important uh, points in the debate, and I want to come back to try and address as much as possible. I think this has been a, a very important debate. I think it has shown the progress since the Smith Commission, looking at how we can work constructively um, across different jurisdictions and with the committees of this parliament to get a real difference to what I think should be the outcome and the outputs for audiences and for our creative industries during this process. I've been struck by the depth of insight afforded, the passion, and also, importantly, the genuine commitment here to deliver the kind of BBC that the people of Scotland deserve. And I think we can take this moment uh, collectively working with all the partners, the UK government on the actual charters. It finalises 
Ofcom on the regulation and the BBC on delivery and their, their responsibilities to move the process forward. And so the Parliament's decision does come at a critical point um, in the process. Uh, the draft charter and framework have delivered on some of the Scottish Government's proposition, but not all of it. And we stand here today looking at a real and tangible opportunity for the BBC in Scotland to deliver more and to deliver better, importantly for the creative sector and also culturally. And also from the tenor of the responses and contribution, I do think the Parliament appears willing to continue to support the Scottish Government to push for the delivery that we've been discussing over many months and indeed in the last uh, period of the Parliament and how we go forward with that. And I want to see the BBC delivering better, be organisationally structured to do so, uh, with decentralisation of decision making where possible, commissioning and budgets, uh, and not just depending on the goodwill of the individuals within the BBC that they are at the time. And as I have said in my, at the outset, I have met and continue to meet with the UK Government, the BBC and Ofcom uh, in order to set out that vision to re re reiterate the depth of feeling of Sc in Scotland behind the views we're putting forward forward and the breadth of that across different sectors. So addressing uh, some of the points that have been made uh, during this debate, particularly in relation to the fair share of the licence fee, um, the points that have been made about the disparity between Scotland at 55%, Northern Ireland 74% and Wales at 95% of spend um, of licence fee raised coming back to be spent in Scotland. But I did take the point I think Lewis MacDonald and others have made about and Claire Baker about that being a measurement not a target. And I do think the scrutiny that we now have by the committees of this part will allow us to, to get underneath that and to identify what is actually being spent and why, and is it actually benefiting the creative industries. And remember, it was in the, the committee evidence in, of the last committee on the 12th of January that, that uh, we also heard from Ms Bulford in relation to the spend that 35 million uh, was uh, spent on above the line commissioning for writers, directors, artists and production team talent. Uh, additional spend was spent on uh, production studios, outside broadcast rights, executive producers, etc. Now, the point here is we want to make sure that the investment by the BBC in Scotland is fair and just, and which uh, tackles the uh, proposals for improving the creative economy impact. And that's also the, the points made by Lucy MacDonald about MG Alba and the need to improve the spend there. Actually, that would do two things. It would help in relation to the public service requirement on uh, reflecting nations and indeed regions, but also in reflecting the impact and input onto the creative economy because their impact on independent producers is very strong. And that was a point particularly made by Joe McAlpine um, and, uh, in relation to the public service and uh, new public service aspects of serving uh, Scotland, a very important aspect indeed. Rachel Hamilton has a very good speech referred to the iPlayer requirements now, but also now that there is a homepage for nations and website. I think the question might be asked, why is it taking so long at times when technology is changing? And the real challenge is how do we actually make sure that whatever is provided can be fit for purpose, not just now, uh, but also in the future. And some of the other points that we made, Stuart Stevenson made a very important point about the Sunday trading uh, in between references to the Book of Micah, uh, the Sunday trading aspects in relation to how you might see the same story but through a different lens and how it can be helpful to have that wider perspective and the importance of not having a metropolitan view. I, I'm going to qu uh, quote the Welsh Minister, of course Wales and Northern Ireland are similarly having debates like this, and the Welsh Minister Alan Davis on the 27th of September said, this is about how we change the culture within the BBC. I agree with much uh, with the analysis from his friend from Lethley in that there is a metropolitan culture within the BBC that believes that it knows best for the whole of the United Kingdom. And Jamie Green, in what I thought was an excellent speech, did make the point that diversity is a strength and that creativity uh, can actually uh, benefit from that diversity. And I think that's the mindset that we're encouraging uh, the BBC to adopt, uh, organisationally and structurally, where at all possible. Ross Greer talked about, and then reminded us actually of why we are where we are in terms of looking at this, of the deep-seated dissatisfaction and the statistics of the, uh, of the reports from the BBC themselves about how they reflect Scotland to itself. And he also made a very important point about uh, there's much that needs to be progressed that's outside the charter process. We are here during the end game of the charter process, but there's much to continue in discussions with Ofcom and BBC continuing. Uh, I can also say that I also find Robot Wars strangely addictive. <laughs> when I watched it with my son, I hadn't realised in terms of, I suppose, the Scottish production value uh, within that. 
Uh, Tower Scott made an important point on governance. One of the things that we would like to see, however, is a move to make sure that the Scotland and Scottish ministers did the appointment in relation to the uh, member of the BBC board. The current proposal is that we would, as I said previously, uh, take an opportunity to be involved, clearly, um, and that we have the key say. I don't think there would be much difference for us leading it and then the UK then uh, working to, to agree. Decentralisation, as I've said, would allow for a greater degree of autonomous decision-making at operational board uh, level. The creation of a Scottish Unitary Board and not just a, a BBC-appointed subcommittee, I think is important. I think one of the lessons I think uh, Jackson Carla reported about the governance widely of the UK, that some kind of external aspects to the BBC, whether at UK-wide level or indeed at Scottish level, uh, is something that we should consider uh, as part of um, the developments moving forward. In terms of some of uh, other contributions in particular, um, I was also very struck by a lot of the references um, to how Scotland sees itself. I thought Emma Harper reflected the, the opportunities that we have in taking that forward. But in terms of what we have achieved, and I think Claire Baker was correct in identifying, well, there are a number of things that we have actually managed to achieve. An enforceable Scottish service licence for Scotland for the first time, a dedicated member of the board for Scotland, a commitment to continue supporting for Gallup Broadcasting and MG Alba, but we need to go further, proposals for the BBC to report on for the very first time on its contribution to Scotland's creative economy and also removing the charter from the election cycle. And as Joe McAlpine reflected, a very important new public purpose to reflect, represent and serve the nations and regions. Presiding officer, I think this has been a very good debate. I think in terms of what we can do and how we go forward, uh, we've got a few things to reflect on. Some of the aspects I haven't touched on at Channel 4, I think there is a strong feeling in Scotland that we need to make sure that it occupies a unique position and we would be against any privatisation of Channel 4 and that's something perhaps we may come back to at another point. And we've talked about governance. But this, presiding officer, is an opportunity. If the BBC so grasps this, uh, both the BBC at UK level and at Scottish level as it appoints its new, new director for Scotland to be bold and to be ambitious, to serve Scotland, to serve itself and to make sure that the, the, the way that Scotland sees itself through its public service broadcaster has a sustainable future of quality, not just for today, but for many years to come. Thank you, the Cabinet Secretary, for concluding that debate. And the next item of business is consideration of a legislative consent motion. And I would ask Michael Matheson to speak to and move motion number 1832 on the UK Investigatory Powers Bill. Moved. <laughs> the question of this decision will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. Yes, we'll take the point of order now. Jenny Mara. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At lunchtime today, 15 minutes after FMQs had concluded, the Scottish Government published Audit Scotland Section 22 Emergency Report on NHS Tayside and NHS 24. Presiding Officer, the timing of laying Section 22 reports is entirely within the Scottish Government's control, not Audit Scotland's. I do not see it as any coincidence, Presiding Officer, that the Scottish Government chose to publish these reports safely after the last opportunity before recess for Parliament to ask questions of the Government. <laughs> Presiding Officer, NHS Tayside's finances are in disarray. They will have to make nearly £60 million of cuts this year, double the cuts they made last year. They still won't break even, they won't be able to pay back their ever-increasing loan from the Scottish Government and they will still have to come back to the Government for the fourth year running to ask for more. Four years of loans and it seems the only solution the Scottish Government has to this is to swallow up these debts and spiral in costs into larger health boards. Presiding Officer, do you have any power in the interests of parliamentary scrutiny to compel the Government to lay reports so that Parliament has a chance to question ministers in a timely fashion and is not allowed to try to bury bad news over recess. Can I, can I thank the member for advance notice of the point of order? Uh, I, I believe... Members, wait a second. 
the member will know, first of all, I cannot compel uh, the government uh, on publication. I don't believe this is a point of order. Uh, it's clearly a matter over which the member and other members will have a, a, a genuine interest and would wish to question the government. Now, I make no assumptions whatsoever about the timing of the publication. I would simply ask the Cabinet Secretary and the government to reflect on the timing of future publications. We now move on to the consideration of the next item of business, which is two parliamentary bureau motions. And I ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move on block motion 1860 on the establishment of a subcommittee and motion 1861 on the subcommittee meeting. Moved on block. Thank you. There are four questions today. The first question is that motion 1828 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the draft BBC charter be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next question is that motion 1832 in the name of Michael Matheson on the UK Investigatory Powers Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next question is that motion 1860 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the establishment of a subcommittee is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And the final question is that motion 1861 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the subcommittee meeting be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I thank members. I would invite you to have an enjoyable recess and I close this meeting.